Hello, Wizards. Today, I'm going to present the 10 most important concepts for new poker players. In this video, I've outlined 10 of the most important concepts for newer poker players. This video is designed to help you overcome common leaks, improve the way you study, and change your mindset for the better so that you can achieve long-term success as a poker player. Let's dive right in. Let me start with the most controversial suggestion I could think of. Learn the mechanics of game theory. Start by learning the absolute fundamentals. See, the problem with poker is that the feedback loop is very broken. You'll often be rewarded for terrible plays and punished for great plays. And that's because the edges are quite small and there's a lot of variance involved. So trying to learn through direct experience will only take you so far and is more often than not just a recipe for setting money on fire. So if you want to progress as a poker player, you need to start to understand these concepts in game theory, such as indifference, exploitability, expected value, pot odds, minimum defense frequencies, and so on. Now you do not need to be calculating all of these concepts at the table, but you do need a sense for how these actually work. For example, if your opponent bets bigger, you don't need to defend as wide. Or if the stack to pot ratio is small, that means if there's not a lot of money behind relative to the pot, you need to be prepared to stack off wider. Indifference just means a hand is close to the line. It is very close to one decision or the other. And it's important to separate points of indifference from, for example, a clear snap fold or a clear snap call. It's called learning thresholds. And so rather Rather than trying to calculate all of this stuff, what you're trying to do is learn what these concepts mean and how to apply them to your game in a broad, abstract sense. One of the fastest ways to become a reasonably solid poker player is by studying thresholds. A threshold is a line of indifference. That is to say, what is, for example, the strongest hand I fold or the weakest hand I continue? That would be your continuation threshold. Or you can ask, maybe if you're making a bet, what is the weakest hand I can bet for a value? That is to say, when I bet this hand and get called, I'm still ahead. That's a value bet. Understanding where these thresholds are on different boards, different textures, against different you know, positions in different spots is fundamental to becoming a good poker player. Beginners always massively misevaluate these thresholds, commonly by overvaluing what amount to medium strength hands that feel to them like big hands. So the next time you review a GTO solution, go out of your way to ask these simple questions and find the very basics of your continuation threshold or your value raise threshold or your value bet threshold. This is the quickest, easiest way to become a solid player without having to memorize everything. Okay, here's an example of how you can use GTO Wizard to find thresholds. Let's say you're playing the big blind facing the button on Queen Jack 6. This is a single raise pot using a 50 NL rake structure. Let's say the button bets 75%. We can see that there's a whole lot going on and trying to memorize everything is really hard. So don't do that. Firstly, I recommend you change your view from vertical to horizontal. That's because this is a flush draw board and it's going to be easier to identify flush draws in your range. Secondly, utilize this filters tab. Now I want you to ask yourself a question. What is the strongest hand we fold? Answer that question for made hands and draws. Well, facing a 75% pot size bet, the strongest hand you fold is about jack-8, jack-9 without a backdoor flush draw. Similarly, about 6x with no backdoor flush draw, and hands like 9s, 8s, 7s, and 2s through 5s are all folding. These hands have fewer outs than your 6x, despite, you know, 8-8 eight, eight technically looking stronger than a 6. Similarly, you can ask about your draws. Well, you're never going to be folding an open-ender or a flush draw or a combo draw, but you might fold a gut shot, right? Know where that continuation line is. That's what's important. That's going to sculpt your strategy. And remember, it changes depending on the size of their bet. If they bet 33%, you're going to be continuing much wider, right? Now, you're going to be mostly calling your 7s through 9s, but you start folding your 2s through 5s without a heart. Find where that cutoff point is. Find your continuation line. You know, now you're calling all of your gut shots, except for the very worst ones. Similarly, you can try and find value thresholds. For example, let's say you're playing the button here and you want to know how you should proceed on the turn, on this brick turn. Well, we see a whole bunch of different sizes here. You're a little confused. Use this drop down, group them together, and now we see it mainly just overbets or checks. How's the overbet constructed? Hover over this icon and you can see it's mostly going to be top pair plus for value and mixing in 
you know, some draws, some ace high, flush draws, combo draws. And in fact, you can press this button that isolates the betting range and you can use the filters here. Well, we know that about top pair plus is what's going to be value betting, right? You can't be doing this with second pair. You can't over bet with a jack because you're just overplaying your hand. You know that most draws can be put in here at some frequency. And reasonable hands like second pair or weak queen x are not strong enough to overbet. These hands should check back and play a medium strength range. So find your value thresholds, find your continuation thresholds, figure out what hand class is appropriate for what action, use the filters, use the grouping, and try and find the overall shape of the range rather than trying to meticulously memorize each and every frequency. This leads me to point number three. It's not about your hand, it's about your range. Look, I see this all the time. People will come up and they'll be obsessed with some obscure triple barrel bluff with 10-9 off that they have at 0.001% in their range. That's not important. What actually matters is your overall strategy. When you triple barrel, are you using appropriate value hand classes for how much money you're putting in? Are you roughly using the right amount of value and bluffs overall relative to the bet sizes. For example, if you open 8-6 suited here, the actual frequency that you open this hand is irrelevant. What actually matters is how much you're opening overall. If you open too wide, people can exploit you by 3-betting more. If you open too tight, people can overfold and then your aces don't get paid enough. It's about the overall range construction rather than the minutia of each combination within your range. Tip number four, winning the pot more often does not equate to maximizing value, okay? This is really common. The human mind tends to remember losses more strongly than wins, and this creates a very natural cognitive bias, tempting people to try and win the pot immediately instead of making the highest EV play. That's going to cause you to overplay medium hands because you're afraid of getting outdrawn. It's going to cause you to overfold in spot where you have big implied odds, spots where, you know, you're going to lose more often than not, but you're missing out on that opportunity to win a massive pot. Let me give you an example. Let's say we roll this dice, one through six. If it rolls one through five, you give me $10. Pretty bad bet, right? Five out of six times you're gonna lose. However, let's say when we roll a six, I give you $100. Now all of a sudden, you're going to be losing often, sure, but your overall expected value is $8.33 per roll. That's awesome. That's a huge chunk of value in your favor, despite the fact that you're losing so often. You're going to win a huge pot once in a while because you're maximizing value instead of looking at how often you're going to win. And the same concept applies all the time in poker. Let's look at an example. So back to this Queen Jack 6 example. Let's say you've bet small on the turn, big blind calls, and its action is on you on the turn. Now, I think a lot of novices will see all the draws on this board. You know there's going to be 5-4, there's going to be Ace-10 and King-10 and 10-9 and a million different heart draws. That's scary. So what do most of them do? Well, they start barreling a bunch of their second and third pair. They start putting a bunch of medium hands into their betting range because they're terrified of getting outdrawn. But the truth is you're not going to be folding out most of the hands that you want to fold anyway with a bet. And if you bet large enough that you do start to fold out flush draws and straight draws, well, you've now completely overplayed your hand to the point where you won't be ahead by the river. So it's a null strategy. Instead, you need to accept the fact that your second pair is just going to get outdrawn sometimes, and that is the way it is. Similarly, let's say you decide to overbet on the button. Actions on you in the big blind. You have a hand like, for example, 5-4 suited here. Now 5-4 is way behind all of their value. And in fact, I'm going to switch this drop down to all we can see that the equity of this hand is 29%. That means we're going to be losing this hand, you know, more than two thirds of the time. However, the expected value is positive because when we do hit our draw, we're going to stack villain for a bunch of money. You know, we hit a flush draw, we're going to stack all of their straight draws, their two pairs and their sets. Those implied odds make this a valuable call. Same story with a seven here. You know, this hand is behind, however, because of all the extra implied odds we win on the river from big hands when we hit, this is going to be a plus EV call. You shouldn't be folding this hand despite the fact that you only have ace high. So instead of thinking about how often you're going to win the pot, think about how much money you can win. Maximize your value rather than how often you win the pot. 
Tip number five, stop overvaluing big cards. Most recreational players massively overvalue big cards. Any ace, anything with Broadway cards is, you know, just so strong. If they, for example, face a three bet and a four bet, they're not letting go of ace jack. It's ace jack. Why would you let go of this hand? Or for example, if you have queens and you bet flop turn and river and then you face a river check raise on a flush completing straight completing boat completing run out you need to let that hand go you've just got an overpair right a great hand pre-flop doesn't translate to a great hand post-flop i think a lot of this comes down to some form of entitlement tilt you know you deserve to win the pot because you had a good hand pre-flop but that's just not how it works and in fact that kind of behavior is going to kill the value of your premium hands because you're going to run into so many reverse implied odds especially playing cash games 100 big blinds deep that the ev you gain by betting them off the hand is completely dwarfed by the massive pots you lose when you can't fold these post flop so don't overplay big cards this leads me to my next point. Most of your EV comes from nutted hands, assuming you're not overplaying them post-flop. For example, here we can see that most hands are extremely close to break even. 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Realistically, very few hands in your range make up the vast majority of your expected value. That's why it is so important to learn how to play your nutted hands correctly and to optimize your strategy such that your nutted hands actually get paid off, right? If you're a complete nit, you probably aren't going to extract a whole lot of value when you do make a strong hand because, well, frankly, people are going to recognize that you're a nit. Similarly, if you overplay all of your weak hands, sure, you might get paid off when you have value, but it doesn't matter because you've already lost 50 pots spewing it off with queen two suited. I want to show you a graphic by a good friend of mine named Kevin. This is something he posted on 2 plus 2 a couple years ago, and this shows the expected value of every hand in a button opening range. As we can see, hands like aces, queens, kings, ace kings, jacks, these premium hands make up the vast majority of your expected value. For reference, the size of the square is equal to your EV. The rest of these hands are icing on the cake. They're flavoring, they're designed to get the bigger hands paid off for the most part. Now, when it comes post-flop, this is no longer going to be the case. You know, different hands will become nutted hands. But overall, what actually matters is how you play these high EV nutted hands, because that is where most of your EV comes from. Realistically, most of your value in poker comes from just coolering people, just, you know, having the better hand and making them pay with a worse hand. And conversely, avoiding spots where you have the worse hand, like ace jack off, facing the better hand. So learning to play your nutted hands well is absolutely fundamental to improving your win rate as a poker player. Tip number seven, start by mastering your preflop strategy. Mastering preflop is the quickest and most efficient way to drastically improve your results. That's because every decision starts with preflop. If you make this part of your strategy automatic, not only do you set yourself up to play post-flop well, but it's one less thing to think about when you're actually playing poker at the table. So make this part of your game automatic. The best way to do that is to check out GTO Wizards new practice mode, which lets you practice from preflop all the way till river. By practicing this, by making this strategy just something that's automatic to your play, you're going to set yourself up, play well on every street going forward. Tip number eight, and this one's a bit controversial. Most of your heuristics are based on lies. You see, almost every heuristic, rule of thumb, generality you come up with is inevitably going to be based on faulty assumptions. And that's because if you play through experience, your perception of a winning play will be skewed by the meta in which you play. It's gonna be skewed by factors such as risk aversion and bias and wanting to win the pot more often. To truly grow as a poker player, you need to let go of old habits and broaden your horizons. And this is especially true when you're first starting to work with solvers. You see, solvers are confusing and the vast majority of people have some worldview in mind, some overall strategic hierarchy that they believe this is the way poker ought to be played. And then they just confirmation bias their own results. They'll just look at the strategy and they'll only look for things that confirm their old worldview rather than trying to decipher why their worldview might be wrong in some spot. I mean, this is true outside poker too, but more so in poker. You need to accept the fact that most of your heuristics your generalities are based on lies and faulty assumptions because you cannot learn, you cannot grow as a poker player until you accept that the more you know, the more you know you don't know.
Tip number nine. Variance is much, much bigger than the human mind can conceptualize. The gambler's fallacy is very common among poker players. Let me give you an example. Let's say we flip a fair coin and it lands on heads six times in a row. What's the probability that it lands on heads on the seventh flip? Well, if you're a suspicious gambler or, you know, just like most recreational poker players, you might think to yourself, wow, you know, six heads, we're pretty much O to tails, right? But no. That's not how it works. The next flip is still 50-50. You're just as likely to flip a seventh head as you were to flip heads the first time. And that must be the case because the coin is 50-50. So what's going on here? Well, you need to understand the law of large numbers. After thousands of flips, we expect heads and tails to even out. But that's not some universal godly karma. It's just the law of large numbers. Imagine we continue to flip a thousand times and heads retains that six point lead. At that point, we will have flipped 503 heads and 497 tails. This is actually the expected value when starting with a six point lead for heads. At that point, we flip 50.3% heads and 49.7% tails. That's much closer to 50-50 than we started with, despite the fact that tails never caught up. And if you keep increasing the sample size and you keep retaining that same lead, well, you're going to come up with the same numbers. It's going to get closer and closer to 50, despite tails never catching up. And that's just how it works out. Similarly, we see the same thing in poker. Just because, you know, you've had some run bad doesn't mean the deck owes you anything, right? Just because villain sucked out on you three times in a row doesn't mean they're less likely to suck out on you the next time. The deck doesn't have memory. So you need to understand that poker has a lot of variance. And in fact, there's a tool I recommend you play with to get your mind around this concept. This is a poker variance calculator. This one's by Prime Dope, but others exist. So let's imagine you're a solid cash game winner. You win five big blinds per hundred. Very solid, very respectable and standard deviation is 100. This is completely typical. This is to say how swingy your results are. You don't need to understand this exact number, but just know this is very normal for a six max cash game. Let's say you play, I don't know, a thousand hands. What are the chances that you come out ahead, that you win money after a thousand hands? Well, if we calculate, we can see the probability of a loss after a thousand hands is about 43%. So, you know, pretty high chance that you lose money. Okay, what about 10,000 hands? Surely it has to start converging after 10,000. Well, there's still a 30% chance that you lose money after 10,000 hands. Okay, what about 100,000 hands? That's a huge sample, right? That's more than some people play in a year. Well, there's still a 5% chance that despite being a very solid winner and putting in a ton of volume, that you still lose 5.69%. That's huge. That's like more than one in 20. So you need to realize that variance is way bigger than the human mind can conceptualize. We cannot, in our minds, wrap our heads around 100,000 hands, let alone conceive that a winning player would be losing after that many hands. Yet statistically, this is gonna happen once every 20 runs or something, right? This is completely possible. And the inverse is also true. You can run like an absolute god, right? You can, for example, at probably the best of this interval, you're going to be winning a ton of money, despite the fact that you might not be playing that way. People often ask, you know, is poker skill or is it gambling? And the truth is, it's both. You need to accept that this is a gambling game and it is a skill game. You can have an edge, the same as you could have an edge trading stocks in the stock market, but you're still gambling and you're still taking on risk and you can still lose despite playing a good strategy. Wrapping your head around this variance is fundamental to long-term success in poker because like it or not, every bad poker player is going to have an absolute horrific downswing if they play long enough. That is just guaranteed. The reverse is also true. They're going to run like a god at some point. You really need to look at both and you need to understand that this game has a ton of swings. Tip number 10. Final tip of the video, stop overplaying medium strength hands. Guys, this is really common. You need to develop a medium strength, showdown value, pot control, check back kind of range. Most weak aggressive players have two strategies. They've got the give up range and everything else gets the gas pedal. This type of player never wins a showdown with those marginal hands because they either bet so aggressively that they fold out their opponent or they get to showdown against a narrow range that has them crushed. This is not a good way to organize your equity. 
A better way is to construct value and bluffs. That way you're polarizing using strong hands and weak hands and the opponent is guessing with every hand in between. Meanwhile, your medium hands, which are gonna check more and realize their equity, get to show down against the range they can actually beat. If you want to learn more about this system, you can look up, for example, the post-flop game plan or the four categories of poker. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in this video because there's a ton of content about this already on the internet, but essentially you want more than give up and gas pedal. You also want medium that just wants to realize equity and go to showdown. All right, that's it for the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this kind of content, please let me know. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. And of course, if you want to discuss this more, please join our Discord. Link is in the description. We'll be happy to answer all of your theoretical questions there. Thanks for watching.